Welcome back to D20 Tactics. On this channel, I play Dungeons and Dragons with my friends, and we explore combat scenarios and play out the tactics used to defeat monsters quickly and safely, giving you more time to get back to roleplaying. I'm your host and Dungeon Master, Sarson Zero, and this week we have a recap of the dungeon recently completed by Azure Wolf, Blind Oracle, Fear No Equal, and Longfish. First, I'll replay the six encounters of the Eye Beast Lair, and then we'll talk about the encounters that we thought deserved more commentary. If you recently watched those encounters, I'll put a timestamp at the start of the discussion in the description below. All of our heroes made it home after this one, so sit back, relax, and enjoy. The adventurers are going to delve into the lair of an Eye Beast, a classical and notorious monster that lives in the depths of the earth, chewing out caverns with its disintegration rays and populating with monsters to protect itself from adventurers doing exactly what they're going to do, coming down and slaughtering it. Cleric, are you pre-casting any spells? I am pre-casting a level 4 aid and a level 6 hero's feast. At level 4, 8 will give us 15 hit points to my three other companions. Hero's feast, the hit points maximum increase by 2d10, which I rolled a 9. Creature is cured of all disease and poison, becomes immune to poison and being frightened, and makes all wisdom saving throws with advantage. So good. I am also going to cast a level 2 warding bond with the wizard. We have to stay within 60 feet. Plus 1 bonus to AC and saving throws. Resistance to all damage. Also, each time it takes damage, I take the same amount of damage. Wizard, what are you pre-casting? Find familiar to get my owl. Ritual casting water breathing on the party. Ritual cast simulacrum. Mage armor on me and the simulacrum. He's going to get the cloak of protection and the other wand that I had. Hit points, abilities, spells, items in hand, as usual. I am at 110 HP. In my hand is the wand of the war mage plus two and my wand of magic missiles. Four first level, three second, three third, three fourth, two fifth. One six. Arcane recovery is still available. Blind Oracle. I have 139 out of 139 hit points, holding a plus two short bow. A Focklucan Bandor has fly, invisibility, levitate, protection from evil and good, entangle, fairy fire, shillelagh, and speak with animals available. Sneak dice all day. I have 172 of 172 hit points. I have second wind and action surge available, and I have two uses of indomitable available. I have a great X plus two in hand. I have a circlet of blasting and another one in the bag. Longfish. I am currently at 138 out of 138 hit points. I am holding the staff of Python and shield plus two. I have four level one, two level two, three level three, three level four, two level five, and one level seven spell slot remaining. Two charges of channel divinity. Simulacrum. He is currently 43 HP. Four level first slots, three level two, three level three, three level four, two level five, one level six, and his wand. Monsters, abilities, items, and numbers. In this encounter, at the entrance to the dungeon, the adventurers face down against a behir, bear, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. I think we're getting into a lot of monsters I don't know how to pronounce. And a couple of small eye beasts. The behir is like a lightning lizard with multiple legs. They can shoot a lightning breath, they can constrict, they can swallow people because they are a huge monstrosity. They got a passive perception of 16, so an active check will put them in threat range of our rogue. They are immune to lightning damage, as you would expect a lightning lizard to be. The small eye beasts are going to spectate for this fight and maybe get involved. They have a bite attack, which isn't very good, but they can shoot two eye rays a turn with 90 foot range. They can confuse you, paralyze you, cause you fear, or wound you, which is fun. They also have the ability to spell reflect back as a reaction which is rough they have a passive perception of 16 as well sorry rogue you're gonna have to be making checks on this one am i are you at 25 yeah with a potential perception of 26 they could find you okay if you roll below a 10 and you get a 10 and they roll a 20 and they tried to find you <laughs> i mean i probably won't try it but they potentially will have to do it I, you want to burn an action that's that's a win for me. Maybe you choose not to make the rolls, just to tempt me into doing it. Terrain and effects. The terrain's pretty straightforward. Not a lot of notes about this. Plenty of difficult terrain outside. Plenty of things to hide behind. Lots of trees. There is a choke point of sorts in the middle here. So there's going to be a lot of opportunity to try to get angles and, and duck back into cover. So that'll be fun. The inside, once you cross through the threshold here, the inside is 15 feet high. There's no questions. We'll move on to tactics. What do you guys think for tactics in this fight? As the small person, don't get eaten. 
So I missed out on the simulacrum last time. I assume that that's a fairly valuable early resource and we should just go ahead and protect it long enough for it to blow out its spells? That seems to be the way to go with it because it's going to be the target. So yeah. It's got such a small hit point pool. So I think we want to try and drag them into coming out of the cave so that we can avoid pop and shoot lesser eye beasts. Use the simulacrum on the Bahir as much as possible to just lay down damage. Those guys are basically groundbound dragons, so we make them take this fight outside. All right, let's get into it then. Go ahead and roll initiative. Anybody have higher than a 20? Anybody have between a 20 and a 15? 15 on the fighter. Anybody have between a 15 and a 10? 12, 5 on the rogue. Anybody have between a 10 and a 5? I got a 9 on the Bahir. 7 for the wizard, 5 for the owl. And Cleric, what do you got for me? 2 minus 1. I want to block, so I'm going to move to the cave mouth and dodge. I want to draw some fire off the wizard. After that, we're going to go to the rogue. Is it feasible to hide in the difficult terrain behind the rock that is northeast of the fighter? Yeah. Perfect. Let's go ahead and move there. I think I have to dash to do that. Five will get you there. Dash action. Perfect. And then hide action. A 23. My minimum is 25. The Bahir's turn, Lesser Eye Beast is going to move. We're going to try to go for the fighter. First one is a Paralyzing Ray. Fighter, give me a DC 13 Constitution save versus Paralysis. 25. That'll pass. Give me a DC 13 Constitution save versus Wounding Ray. 19. That'll turn 20 points of Necrotic into 10 points of Necrotic. And then he's going to move back there. And these are 90 foot range, which is fine. The same thing, give me a DC 13 versus Paralysis. 25. Another 25, sounds good. And then another DC 13 versus wounding. 29. You're going to turn 14 into 7. The Bahir is going to move forward. It has a bunch of legs, so it moves awfully fast. With 50 feet of movement, it's going to get within 20 feet of you and hit you with a line of lightning. A DC 16 dexterity save. You're dodging, so you have your advantage on this. 15. 15, that sounds like a fail. 48 points of lightning damage. And then the Bahir is going to move back. After that, we're going to go to the wizard. Perfect. I'm going to cast a magic missile. Going to blow two charges. Dice is going to be a two. Two plus one is three. Three plus five is eight. Eight times four is 32. He's going to take 32 points of force damage. I would like to move northeast there as far as I can. And you have any command for your simulacrum? To burn it with disintegrate. And then the simulacrum goes. Tell me about it. Going to cast Disintegrate. We're going to overchannel with this bad boy. It is a DC 18 deck save. Doesn't look good. Fails with a 9. Because it's overchanneled, it does max. 10d6 plus 40. 10d6 could be 60. Plus 40 is 100. 100 points of force damage. And he's going to join me up here. I don't have to go look at our records. That is definitely the damage record. After the wizard, we go to the owl. Yeah, let's get behind the rogue because uh don't think I can get in and get out safely. After the owl, we go to the cleric. Can you move me one space to the northwest of the fighter? And I am going to cast Sacred Flame on the lizard. It's two on the die, plus three is a five. Three D6 for 12 points of damage, and I will enter. After that, we go to the top of the order, which is the fighter. Let's just go in to contact with the Bahir, and we're going to attack. Attack number one is a 26 to hit. Hits. 14 damage. Attack number two, that is a crit yep. for 20 damage. Lethal. And then retreat 10 feet as close to the rogue as I can. Bonus action, second win, D10 plus 14 healing, gonna grant me 17 HP. After the fighter, we go to the rogue. Let's do this. So I'd like to pop out from behind the rock. There's no way to see that front eye beast is there. Not unless... I gotta get to there? You would need to be down here. Let's click the boots of speed, move there, take the shot with advantage from breaking concealment, and then 27 to hit. 27 will connect. For 29 points of damage, use the rest of my move back behind the rock. After the rogue, we go to my turn. We're going to do what we should have been doing from the beginning. This guy's going to move. He's going to shoot an eye beam at the simulacrum. Simulacrum, give me a DC 13 constitution save versus wounding. Sure. That is a 16. Half 25 sends it to 12. And I got one square left, so I'm going to go skirmish. And then after I'm done skirmishing, I'm going to use my other eye beam ability. We're going to hit the fighter with paralysis. Fighter, give me a DC 13 con save versus paralysis. Well, I didn't roll a two, so it's good. 21. The other one is going to go, so he can actually get there. Does he have line of sight? He does not. So we're just going to hit the fighter with the paralysis, DC 13. 21. Pass. You are not paralyzed and might as well hit you with the wounding as well. DC 13 versus 28. 
So you're going to take this 9 and turn it to 4 points of necrotic. That's both of my guys. After my turn, we're going to go to the wizard's turn. Oh, man. These guys have that one ability. So this is going to be interesting. Let's step out and upcharge another magic missile for two. Their reaction says if the... I-Beast makes a successful saving throw against a spell, or the spell misses. Then they can choose another creature that can see within 30 feet of it and redirect the attack. This is not a thing that can miss, it's not a thing they save against, so they can't use their ability. Yeah, I took a gamble. Two on the dice again. Two on the die, plus one is three, plus five is eight. Eight times four is 32, and this guy drops. Three more squares of movement. You're gonna hang out, you're gonna stay, you're gonna move. Back north. After that, we go to the simulacrum. He's gonna fire a magic missile, he's gonna move up. It's gonna be uh, do level three, just in case. Glad I did level three, because that's a one on the die. One plus one is two, two plus five is seven, seven times five is 35, takes 35 points of damage. And let's move him back behind the wizard. After that, we go to the owl. Yeah, let's move in and give to Biter, I guess. After the owl, we go to the cleric. Move me two spaces to the south of the fighter, and I will drop another Sacred Flame on the Eye Beast. Dex, 18. He gets a nat 20, plus 2 is 22. He makes this successful save against the throw. He's going to choose another creature within 30 feet, which is going to be the Owl. The spell targets the chosen creature instead of the spectator. The spell forces saving throw, the chosen creature makes a save of its own. So Owl, give me a DC 18 dexterity save. That is a 12. 12 sounds like a fail. Cleric, give me some damage. 14 damage. 14 points of damage to the owl. I think that's lethal for the owl. Yeah, he's only got one. Cleric, anything else? That'll be it. End turn. After that, we go to the top of the order, fighter. Advance two spaces to the southeast. I'm going to use my gem of brightness to try and blind him. It's a DC 15 constitution check against blindness. 15 on the nose. And then I will drop to the southwest, and that'll be it for me. After that, we go to the rogue. Same play as before, although I think I have to take a hide bonus action first and then shoot. It's a 30. 30 will do it. Very sneaky. Much woe. And then we'll take the attack at advantage. 18 to hit. 18 will do it. For a total of 37 points of damage. He drops. Nice. And that's the encounter. Port hit points. 120 of 172. 139 of 139. The wizard has 110. Simulacrum. He's at 31. 138. The dungeon has been breached. The adventurers are on the way to clearing out the eye beasts that remain within. Hit points, ability spells, items in hand. Hit points, 120 of 172. Great Axe plus 2 in hand. I have my Action Surge available and two Indomitables, and I used one charge on my Gem of Brightness out of 50. I am wearing one Circlet of Blasting with another in my bag. 110 hit points remaining. I've used up four charges on my Wand of Magic Missile. As for my spell slots, I still have all four first level, all three second, all three third, all three fourth, two fifth, one sixth. Arcane Tradition is still up and ready to go. And as for the simulacrum, he is sitting at 31 HP, four first level slots, two second remaining, three third, three fourth, two fifth. 139 out of 139 hit points, holding a plus two short bow, shooting plus one arrows, the instrument of the bards on my back. We have fly, invisibility, levitate, protection from evil and good. Entangle, Fairy Fire, Shillelagh, and Speak with Animals still available. Boots of Speed have nine minutes remaining. Currently at a 138 hit points, I am holding the Staff of Python and Shield plus two. I have four level one, two level two, three level three, three level four, two level five, and one level seven spell slots remaining. I have both charges of my channel divinity. Monsters, abilities, items, and numbers. This encounter has two fire giants and two small eye beasts. Fire giants are pretty straightforward. They're huge creatures. They move 30 feet. They hit you with great swords and they throw rocks at you. They're immune to fire, as you imagine fire giants might be, but otherwise they're just a bag of hit points in a suit of armor. Small eye beasts have 30 foot fly, a passive perception of 16 as well. They have eye rays that they can shoot two of per turn. One confuses, one paralyzes, one causes fear, and one wounds. So you're going to pick two of those. I like the paralyzing and the wounding. They also have a reaction where they can reflect spells back against you if you miss them with an attack or that they make their save. Terrain and effects. This terrain is pretty straightforward as well. You got some tunnels, you got some rocks. There's some difficult terrain in here, stuff to hide behind. Not much though. These are 15 foot high tunnels, which will accommodate the giants who are also 15 feet high. Tactics, what do you guys think for tactics in this fight? Oof. Spirit Guardian, choke point the gap to the east of us? If we can get there in time. We can't choke point the eye beasts though. Try and avoid spells on those eye beasts and take down the fire giants first, I think. The eye beasts just don't do that much damage. 
Especially if we can force them to fire on the cleric and the fighter. Fighter, you want haste this round? It might be better on cleric to get him into choke pointing. I'll take it if you want to throw it down. We'll see how the initiative order works. Yeah, that, I think that's the only thing, is if Cleric can go very early, it might be worth it just to get him in to separate the fire giants. Otherwise, go ahead and throw it on me. Roger that. If haste is really important. I can also throw haste. Let's go ahead and roll initiative. Anybody up higher than a 20? Anybody got between a 15 and a 20? 18-5 for the rogue. 15. Who's got between a 15 and a 10? Who's got between a 10 and a 5? Uh-oh. Who's got between a 5 and a 0? 5 on the fighter. The Giants have a four. Four minus one. Rogue, you're up first. Bonus action, hide. 25. Then move out, shoot the Giant to the south. 24 to hit. 24 hits. For 42 points of damage. Great sneak die roll. And then as much movement as I can to get back into the corner. That's turn. After the rogue, we go to the wizard. The cleric was going after the fighter, right? So let's haste the fighter with a haste scroll. And my command will be to move up and... Shoot that giant to the south with missile. Simulacra. Fifth level. And that is a four on the dice. Four plus one is five. Five plus five is ten. Ten times seven is seventy. Seventy points of damage to the giant. Crawl back in the hole. <laughs> Can't crawl back in the hole. So do you want to block the fighter or do you want to stand next to the rogue? I have haste. Block me. Fighter, block him. <laughs> After the simulacrum, we go to the speak of the devil fighter. Go ahead and roll out down towards the south fire giant. And then we are going to go ahead and gem of brightness this guy. You know, it's a DC 15 contract. Yeah, do it anyway. Fire giant with a constitution save modifier of plus 10 gets a 21. Oh. Yeah. All right. Well, won't have to do that again. And that'll be it for me. After the fighter, we go to the giants. I got to sync that simulacrum. This guy's going to go over there. Simulacrum, give me a DC 13 constitution save versus the wounding ability. 13 on the head. 16 goes to 8 points of necrotic. Rogue, give me a DC 13 versus paralysis. 21. 21 will pass. Down here, this eye beast is going to move to there, and we're going to check line of sight. I do not have it to the simulacrum, but I do have it to the rogue. Rogue, give me a DC 13 constitution save versus paralysis. 13. Now give me a DC 13 constitution save versus wounding. Five. Five is going to fail. Take 17 points of necrotic. Are you concentrating on anything? I am not. Do you like being included in the concentration checks? I do. It's fun. I am going to use my reaction to half that 17 damage. Does it have to be an attack? Because this is not. Let me look. Reactions, uncanny dodge, and attack. Yep, nope. I'll take that 17. Sorry, that guy's going to move to there, and he's going to go after the fighter, surprising nobody. So here's the greatsword attack. 29 to hit you. AC is 21. 39 points of slashing damage. All fives and sixes. Second attack. 21 to hit you. 21's exactly what you need. 27 points of slashing damage. Concentrating on anything? Nope. I have no brain. I am fight. This guy's going to go... He's got a 60-foot throw, so you're at long range for the raw. We're going to throw against the simulacrum. i got to drop the nat 20, unfortunately, but we're going to stick with the 14 plus 11 is 25 to hit the simulacrum. Wow. 21 with shield. 34 points of damage with the rock. Yeah, he's down. After the giants is the cleric. Put me two spaces to the north of the eye beast. I will throw a level three guiding bolt at the giant that's already hurt. The south giant. 22 to hit. 22 hits. For 20 damage. They're lit up. Next person attacking it has an advantage. Does it enter in there? After that is the top of the order with the rogue. Let's go ahead and move behind the cleric. Hide bonus action. 28. 28 will do it. You gonna pop a balloon? Yeah. Pop up and shoot an eye beast. 21 to hit. 21 will connect. Guys. Guys, he's a stealth fighter versus a spy balloon. Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. Wow, that's a lot of damage. 44 points of damage? Balloon pops. Was it over water? No, it was over land. Oh, even worse. You good there? Yeah, that's fine. You know the difference between the rogue and an F-22, though? Rogue killed things other than spy balloons. <laughs> After that, we go to the wizard. Pop out and shoot that fire giant. Fireball. Not fireball. It's a magic <laughs> missile. And do, 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 do. Plus two, the final two charges. Two on the dice. Two on the die plus one is three. Three plus five is eight. Eight times four is 32. 32 points of damage is going to drop the giant. You good there? You want to move? I'd like to get back around the corner, trying to get out of line of sight. After the wizard, we go to the fighter. 
move to the I-Beast to the south of me. We're going to drop some attacks on this guy. It's a 24 to hit. Hits for 18 damage. Second attack. That is a crit. Might as well be. For 21 damage. Dead. Move eight spaces back around the corner towards the fire giant. Dash using my haste action to get me to the fire giant. Ooh. I have one attack remaining. You do not. You cannot break it up an action with another action. Then we're going to action search for another three attacks. 17 to hit. 17 misses. A second attack. That's a one. Third time. Wow. And that's a 15 to hit. 15's not going to hit either. So that was three misses. All I needed to roll was like a six. You're going too fast, man. You got to slow down. And that's it for Sonic the Hedgehog. After the fighter, we go to the giant. Giant's going to swing. 22 to hit you. That'll hit. 27 points of slashing damage. That's half my remaining HP. Well, you're going to enjoy <laughs> this 30 to hit you. That'll hit. <laughs> 32 points of slashing damage. And that'll take me down. Frag the weak, hurdle the dead. Giant's gonna advance to there. After the giant, we go to the cleric. Five spaces, diagonal, southeast. And I will chuck a level one guiding bolt at it. 22 to hit. Hits. 21 damage. And, and turn there. After the cleric, top of the order, rogue. Okay, I'm trying to figure out if I'm behind a real rock or not. I am not. Okay. There's a plant right here. Sure. Pop me into the plant. Let's go ahead and take the shot as is without using the hide bonus action. I have advantage from the guiding bolt. 20 to hit. 20 will connect. That will remove the guidance. For another 44 points of damage. Bonus action hide. 30 to hide. Then we'll push to the wizard. Cleric's 40 for me still, so we're good there. The magic missile level 2, 4 on the dice. 4 on the die plus 1 is 5. 5 plus 5 is 10. 10 times 4 is 40. 40 points of damage. Yeah, let's move back just a little bit more. After the wizard, we go to the fighter. Give me a death saving throw. It's a 9. 9 is a failure. After the fighter, we go to the giant. He's going to move to there, and he's going to go after the cleric. 24 to hit your cleric. That will hit. 26 points of slashing damage. You concentrating on anything? No. Nat one on the second one, so that will definitely miss. He's going to move to there. After the giant, we're going to go to the cleric. Move me five spaces straight towards the fighter. That'll break the bond. I'm out of your reach, so I guess you have an RP. 25 to hit you. That will hit. 25 points of slashing damage. Channel divinity. 70 hit points. Where are they going? To the fighter. You got a bonus action? You're going to hang out there. I will hang out there. After the cleric, top of the order of rogue. Let's go ahead and pop out and shoot the giant advantage 28 to hit 28 hits for 42 points of damage bonus action hide 30 after the rogue is the wizard believe i still have a line of sight yeah i think so another second level magic missile three on the dice three plus one is four four plus five is nine nine times four is 36 36 is lethal the giant drops no other clocks are running out now so that will wrap up the encounter report hit points remaining 70 out of 172 122 out of 139 110 87 out of 138 anybody gonna take pre-rest actions i'll pop another channel divinity to get the fighter up to half so i'll gain another 16 hit dice used i spend two hit dice and i recover 17 hit points I spend 8 hit dice and recover 86 hit points. I spend 0 hit dice because I'm full. Spending 6 hit dice, I heal 36. Any post-rest actions? Ritual cast my familiar back. Arcane recovery or no? No, not using arcane recovery yet. Call me to see what we got later on. Whatever this eye beast has collected, it's got a bunch of giants guarding the front of its lair, so it's got to have more interesting stuff deeper within. The adventurers will descend lower and find out what it has. Hit points, abilities, spells, items in hand... 139 out of 139 hit points, holding a plus two short bow, using plus one arrows, and my instrument of the bards still has all spells remaining strung on my back. One charge remaining on the Wand of Magic Missile, 110 hit points, four first level, one second, three third, three fourth, two fifth, one sixth. 172 of 172 hit points. I have second wind and action surge uh, available once again, and two uses of indomitable. And I still have my two circlets of blasting, one on my head, one in my pocket. 118 out of 138 hit points, holding my plus two shield and staff of python. I have three level one, three level two, two level three, two level four, two level five, and one level seven spell slots remaining. I have both charges of my general divinity back. Monsters, abilities, items, and numbers. This is going to be an interesting fight, I think. A creak of a door, a scrape of stone, a snap of a branch. You're not sure what's in this room, but you're certain that there's something here. You're aware of enemies, but you don't know where they are. 
Anybody have a passive perception better than 28? All right. Anybody have a passive perception better than 24? Okay. Anybody have a passive perception better than 12? Yes. Yes. Hi. You're aware of the existence of a single assassin behind the door to the south. They're trying to hide from you, but they are unsuccessful. Assassins have a number of interesting abilities. During their first turn, they have advantage on attack rolls against any creature that hasn't taken a turn yet. They have evasion, just like the rogue does. They also have sneak attack, just like the rogue. They have multi-attack with their two short swords, and they have additional poison damage on that short sword. How do we feel about poison damage? Whee! What? Phenomenal. Hit me again, <laughs> daddy. <laughs> yeah, light crossbows have the loading property, so they can't use multi-attack with the light crossbow. They have a passive perception of 13, a maximum perception of 23, so rogue, you can just take half. There are two additional assassins in this room. One is hiding behind the door over here. The other one is hiding next to the statue here. All right, that's fun. Terrain. Another straightforward terrain encounter. There's a lot of tunnels here. Interestingly, there are four doors. They're marked with black lines, not just on the terrain layer, but on the map itself. The doors are currently closed. If you wish to open them, you can, and the black lines will disappear. There's a couple of pieces of difficult terrain spread around the map, things that you can hide behind. You can completely crawl over all the statues if you want to, though they are difficult terrain to do so. Tactics. What do you guys think for tactics in this fight? Well, we only have the one enemy, so... I think we stay split up and cover the two doors that they can access us from. Once we can identify where they are, then we just mob them fast. You want haste there, fighter? How many casts do you have of haste? I have a bunch of scrolls, dude, so let's use them up. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, do it. If that's that, let's go ahead and jump into combat. Roll initiative. Hey. Anybody have higher than a 20? 24.5. Anybody have between a 20 and a 15? 15 on the fighter. Who's got between a 15 and a 10? 13 on the owl, 9 on the wizard. 8 for the assassin. And cleric, what do you got? 1. You're... I mean, the thing is, like, it's mostly determined by the d20, and somehow you're always rolling terrible on these. Just wants to go first in the second round, that's all. The rogue, you're up first. I don't have any great play here. The door is closed, right? The southern door is closed. The black lines are closed to doors. You cannot see through them. Bonus action to hide, taking 10 for 25. And ready action to attack the first enemy I see. Do you want to move so you have a better line of sight? If I can do that, that'd be great. I can be inside a friendly square that's larger than me, yeah? Cannot stop inside of anybody else's square, friendly or enemy. One east. After the rogue, we go to the fighter. Gonna do it right this time. Two spaces to the southeast, and ready my gem of brightness to blind the first enemy that I see. Interesting, okay. After the fighter, we go to the owl. He's gonna call dodge. After the owl is the wizard. Wizard's gonna pull out a scroll of haste and tap that fighter with it. Fighter, you're jumping around, hopping mad. Caffeine. After that, we go to the assassin. Nobody knows this, but an assassin is gonna move. He needs to do somersaults like the marines. Cardboard box. Cardboard but does he do box. parkour? Another assassin's gonna move. Then the other one's gonna ready an action to stab somebody if they come within range. After that, we're gonna go to the cleric. Cast third level spirit guardian, nominate all my friends as allies. And because the rogue is hidden behind you, you can still see him. After that, we're gonna go to the rogue. Uh, the fighter's probably gonna move. Play it back. Bonus action hide. Ready to shoot the first enemy I see. After the rogue, we go to the fighter. Yeah, let them make the first move here. Step to the southwest and continue readying this gem of brilliance. After the fighter, we go to the owl. He's going to continue to dodge. Wizard. I'm going to dodge because concentration on a spell is going to drop haste. This assassin's going to peek the door. He is not stealth to you guys. You're able to perceive him through his stealth. Starting with the top of the initiative, Rogue, you have something for me. 25 to hit. 25, that'll connect. For 45 points of damage. And then the next one, I think, fighter. DC 15 con save versus blindness. Doesn't look good. He gets a 10, so he gets blinded. He's going to charge the fighter, and he's going to dodge. That's that guy. He gets another save at the end of his turn against the blindness. Oh, thank you. That one. The next assassin It's going to open the door and pop out. I don't think there's any ready actions remaining. It is hidden, so it has advantage on this attack. It's going to shoot the fighter. 22 to hit your fighter. That'll do. 1d8. All the poison is going to get ignored, and 4d6 sneak attack. 20 points of piercing damage, and just for posterity, 29 points of poison damage gets ignored. <laughs> three to there, so it's going to move three back. Then the next assassin is going to appear. It is also hidden, so it's going to go, it's going to take a shot at the fighter, advantage because of the stealth. 21 to hit you. That'll hit. Well, you're nailing those 21s. 
another 20 points of piercing damage, and 22 points of poison damage gets ignored. Then it's going to move to there, close the door, and then do something that you don't know about. Then after that, we're going to go to the cleric. Run over to the door that's just closed, open it, and then walk through two spaces. Do I see with those two, or do I only see one of them? They're no longer hidden. They've used their attack action to break their hide. Okay. Action to use the Python. Ooh, I have to throw it within 10 feet. Oops. That's not good. The snake is not a friend. Wait, what? No, it, it, it listens to your... It's not for purposes of spirit guardians. The snake is not immune to it. That's true. It's an action. You got a bonus action. You get there. I'm good there. Bonus action. Apologize to snake. Snake's initiative is 19. You also didn't issue an order to the snake. It's going to constrict the last guy. After the cleric is the rogue. Let's see if we can clean up that bottom corner. He's dodging. Yes, but he's in melee with a friend and he's blind, therefore we're flat dice. Yes, that's true. It's flat dice, but it's no sneak because he's dodging. But he's in melee with a friend. If you have any disadvantage, you don't get sneak. Or I can shoot the guy next to me. Yeah, the door's open. That's the actual play there. Bonus action hide, taking the 10 for 25, move down, shoot the guy next to Longfish. Let's shoot the Longfish, save the snake. 27 to hit. 27 connects. 41 points of damage. Move around, hang out. It's back up one and turn. Give me the constrict attack roll. Hang on, snake's not friendly and is starting its turn in the zone. Check, fail, eat my own 3d8 damage. Snake is going to take 10 damage flat. Constrict 30 20 to hit. Hits. 2d8 plus 4 for 14 damage total. And the target is grappled. Escape DC 16 until the grapple ends. The creature is restrained and the snake cannot constrict another target. We go to the fighter. Gonna go ahead and attack this fella next to me. Straight dice because he's blind, but dodging. That's a crit. You know, there's only so much I can do. For 27 damage. Second attack. That's a hard miss. Third attack. 18 to hit. Hits. 18 damage as well. 18 is lethal. Can I go northeast of the cleric, or is that taken by the snake? That is taken by the snake. All right, then I will go northwest of the cleric and use my haste attack on this fellow. And that is also a crit. Might as well be. For 23 damage. Gotta pay you back for putting them down. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> After the fighter, we go to the owl. Move south of the fighter and give the rogue advantage. After the owl, we go to the wizard. I'm going to jump down one because I'm going to get two line of sight there. Seize up my last second level slot for a missile. Uh, three. Three plus one is four. Four plus five is nine. Nine times four is 36. He's going to take 36 points of damage and drop. Continue to move diagonal one and over one. That way the rogue can get in there. After the wizard is the assassin. Assassin's going to start its turn off in the zone. Wisdom 18. Fail. Take 12 damage. Then it's going to stab the snake. Ooh. Who stabs a harmless giant boa constrictor? <laughs> Assassins. So he's restrained. When the assassin is restrained, the assassin has disadvantage on attacks. Nat one to hit, and the other one is a 16 to hit the snake. 16, well hit. Give me a DC 15 constitution save on the snake. Roll a 15 on the nose, plus 116 total. Snake's going to take 4 points of piercing damage and 10 points of poison damage. That's the end of the assassin's turn, cleric's turn. Sacred flame on the assassin. Anyone know if restraint gives disadvantage on dex saves? Yes, it does. Dex 18. 10 fails. And 11 damage. I will. One, two, three, four. I can't squeeze through the snake. It's going to be problematic for you to move this snake because you're so slow, but you can move through it at half speed. Yeah, I'll just stay there. After the cleric is the rope. Wow, that's a messy shot. Do I even have the movement? Barely. Yeah, so let's move on the diagonal to the southeast and then take a shot at the remaining assassin. It's restrained, so you have advantage. 19 to hit. 19, that's 40. Flat. Bonus action is going to be to move one square north and hide. 25. After the rogue, we go to the snake. Snake starts to turn off in the zone. Snake made a 19 on the wisdom check. Hey, look at you go, snake. And I'm only eating half of the 3d8, which is a 11. Half of 11 is 5, so 29 damage now. And I'm going to bite. Advantage because of the restraint. 26 to hit. Hits. Ooh, that's a crit. 16 damage. 16 is lethal. The last assassin drops and the encounter ends. Are you going to keep spirit guardians going for the next fight? Yes. Okay. I will end the snake, though. End the snake, yeah. Leaving the Spirit Guardians long enough, it will be ended. Report hit points. 139 out of 139. 132 out of 172. 110 out of 110. 118 out of 138. As usual, I beasts have an eclectic collection of monsters guarding their dungeon, and this one seems to be no exception. Three assassins down, plenty more to go before they find the final boss. Hit points, ability, spells, items, and hand. We are holding a plus two short bow. We are using... 
plus one arrows. Falklook and Bendor still has Entangle, Fairy Fire, Shillelagh, Speak with Animals, Fly, Invisibility, Levitate, Protection from Good and Evil. Available. And three scrolls of haste. Fighter, 132 of 172 HP. Swinging our Great Axe, we still have Second Wind, Action Surge, and two uses of Indomitable available. We've still got those Circlets of Blasting, one on the head, one in the hand. 110 out of 110 HP. One charge remaining on the Wand of Magic Missiles. Four first level slots, three third, three fourth, two fifth, one sixth. Arcane Recovery is still available. In my hand is the Wand of the War Mage. Currently at 118 out of 138 hit points. I have three level one, three level two, one level three, two level four, two level five, one level seven spell slot remaining. I have both charges of French Channel Divinity. The Staff of the Python and the Shield plus two. Monsters, abilities, items, and numbers. The monsters in this fight are two Dark Elf Mages accompanied by three Dark Elf Elite Warriors. Dark Elf Elite Warriors have innate spell casting so they can throw darkness and fairy fire at enemies and they can throw levitate on themselves they have multi-attack so they can use their short sword twice in a turn carries with it 3d6 poison damage everyone except fear no equal how do we feel about poison damage they eat it for breakfast <laughs> they also have a parry ability so as a reaction they can add three to their ac they have hand crossbows hand crossbows also have poison they have a passive perception of 14 so no threat to the rogue the Dark Elf Mages have the same innate spell casting, and then they have a bunch of other spell casting. They have a variety of different spells all the way up to 5th level. They also have the ability to summon a demon once per day, so that could get pretty interesting. Hmm. That's what I've got. Terrain and effects. We're still in tunnels because that's the nature of this dungeon. Directly in front of you is a 20-foot chasm. It's a DC 15 athletics check to climb out of it. Otherwise, these are 10-foot tall tunnels all around you. Any questions about the terrain? How deep is the chasm? 20 feet, 2d6 falling damage. Tactics, what do you guys think for tactics in this fight? That's a good question. We either put a cork in the bottle here, or we let them come out to us. Either way, I think we're facing demons. So I think maybe we let them come out to us to reduce spell damage. They're going to throw darkness around, and that's going to limit our options a lot. 20-foot chasm is going to be interesting. Speak for yourself, I got winged boots. I'm stumped at this one. We do know from previous experience, if we're going to crack open Spirit Guardians, do it early. Because darkness is really going to mess with us. You should still be on. So, it's already got all of us included. How many spellcasters do you have over there? I have Globe of Invulnerability, which would block all 5th level spells. And it's a 10-foot radius around me, if we want to use that. I'm looking how the DC-15 Athletics check interacts with the uh, second story work. You climb at full speed, so everyone else, if they were to climb out, they would be climbing at half speed. You still have to make the check. If you succeed, you do it at full speed. There's no action economy to this. I mean, if you fail, then you can move somewhere else. You just can't climb up. Got it. One of those per turn. And I, I think in the past you said you can dash for another one. Still going to be tough. Yeah, we're not doing that. That's not going to work. <laughs> only you had a way to fly. And that's the other option. So it's either I put the globe up and we cork the bottle like you said, or I put fly on people. I actually thought that Blind Oracle could cast fly on himself, but I might be wrong about that. I have choices. We can levitate and crawl on the ceiling. We could fly. There are choices there. So are we going to cork or are we going to just say go out there? I feel like that's going to come down to initiative. I feel like if we win initiative, it'll be easier to go out there. Actually, yeah, if we win initiative, it'll be easier to cork this up because then they got to come to us again. Yep. If we lose, I think this gets a bit more complicated. I'm going to go south to try and deal with that Dark Elf fighter one way or another. Okay. So hopefully if we cork, then I'll be dealing with him because he's already outside the cork. Makes sense to me. If there's no other thoughts, then let's go ahead and roll initiative. Anybody get higher than a 20? The rogue has a 25.5. 21 on the owl. Anyone have between a 20 and a 15? 17 on the wizard. 15 on the cleric. Yay! <laughs> you found the double digits. Anyone have between a 15 and a 10? 14 on the fighter. I have a six. Brutal. So, Cork? Yeah. Rogue, start us off. I do not have line of sight to that drow warrior down there, really. He's in cover. This is not a floor to ceiling rock. It is a ground rock. Bonus action, hide, take the shot. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's such a waste. A 35 to hide. 32 to hit. 32 hits. 41 points of damage. That's it. After the rogue, we go to the owl. He is going to dodge, because there's nothing really in range. After the owl is the wizard. Cast the 6th level spell, Globe of Invulnerability. I'll need a 10-foot radius, please. Any spell of 5th level or lower, cast from outside the barrier. Can't affect creatures or objects within it. After the wizard, we go to the cleric. Can I see the southmost wizard? Let's take a look. Yeah, you got a line of sight to her. Level 4, Guiding Bolt. What's the range on Guiding Bolt? 120. Hit me. 
Well, please don't hit me, but... 24 to hit. 24 will connect, even with the cover. 76 for 28 damage. That's a lot of damage. Yeah, there's like five fives in there. And then she's guided. Dimly lit, and uh, next person attacking the wizard gets an advantage. You good? Yeah, I'm good. Sounds good. Beat up that wizard. After the cleric, we go to the fighter. I'm going to run south to the dark elf fighter. I'm going to need to dash... But I have boots of flying, so I can go right over that chasm. Do you have to activate those or turn them on? Or nope. They are always on. They just count whenever I'm in flight. That's spiffy. I'm going to push my button. Second wind for 18 health recovered. That's the button you're pushing in this instance? I'm not going to action search, no. Dark elves. They have to figure out how this is going to go down. So first thing we're going to do is summon a pair of demons. The maze that was hit with Guiding Bolt is going to attempt to summon a shadow demon. They have a 50% chance of success on this succeed on a 19 out of a d20. This fiend is going to get a 23 for its initiative. That wizard is going to go hide. The second wizard is going to do the same thing. Here's the d20. They get a 4, so they fail to summon a demon, but that's still their action. They're going to move the elite warriors. Oh, we can't really pot shot you guys because our range is terrible because we just have hand crossbows. He's going to move to there and cast Levitate on himself. He's going to move to there and he's going to cast Levitate on himself. Down here, we're going to throw a Darkness. Because you can't see him, he's going to move to there. No opportunity to attack because you can't see him. After the Dark Elves, we go to the Rogue. Mm. Ugh, I hate that I'm going to damage Fred, but shots taken is better than not. Bonus action, hide. We're going to shoot our first Dark Elf to the east that I can see. Hide automatically succeeds. Attack with advantage. 29 to hit, 42 points of damage. DC 20 concentration for levitate. Mm -hmm. What do you got for me, buddy? Fails. Loses levitate. That's my turn. After the rogue, we go to the shadow demon. Shadow demon can fly for 30 feet. I do not want to go into that zone. Oh, boy. Shadow demon's going to float over to there. They have advantage to hit you because you can't see them. They have disadvantage to hit you because they can't see you. 15 to hit your fighter. AC is 20. That'll miss. After the shadow demon, we go to the owl. I think he's going to still do the dodge thing. After the owl is the wizard. That first fighter there is in range. Level three, magic missile. One on the die, unfortunately. One plus one is two. Two plus five is seven. Seven times five is 35. He's going to take 35 points of damage and drop. After that, we go to cleric. Take one step forward, and I should be in range for sacred flame. Dex 18. Fails. Oh yeah, 17 damage. Here's the concentration save. Fails with a 7. Anything else? I'll go pro. After the cleric, we go to the fighter. I'm going to go south after that runaway dark health fighter. Attack number 1. That is a 15 to hit. 15 misses. Second attack. That's a crit. Only 15 damage on the crit. The concentration save. Passes. The third attack. Another 15 to hit. 15's going to miss. Yep. You good there? Yeah. After that, we're going to go to the dark elves. Dark elf down here is going to dodge. No spells in or out, right? It blocks everything from level 5 and below. Only things cast outside can't come in, but things inside can go out. So, this warrior is going to advance. That guy's going to shoot a crossbow at disadvantage at the wizard. 12 to hit you. Yes. From downtown, this wizard's going to move there and cast greater invisibility on this wizard. Then that wizard is going to cast greater invisibility on the other one, and then they're going to move. After that, we're going to go to the rogue. Well, solve the problem in front of me. Bonus action hide, shoot the drow across the cliff. Can't fail the hide check. Straight to the attack roll. 25 to hit. 25 hits. Not bad. 35 points of damage. After the rogue, we're going to go to the shadow demon. Shadow demon's going to move after the fighter. 19 to hit you, fighter. He sees 20. Yep, after that, we're going to go to the owl. I will move in, do the flyby for the rogue, and come back. After the owl, we go to the wizard. Another magic missile at level 3. Who are we going after? Problem in front of us. That is a 2. 2 plus 1 is 3. 3 plus 5 is 8. 8 times 5 is 40. He'll take 40 points of damage and drop. Beautiful. After the wizard, we go to the cleric. Can't see anything. Stand back up. After moving, stand up. I guess I can start climbing. Give me an athletics check to climb down. Plus 7. Hey, wizard a crit on that. 27. 27 will definitely do it. If I dash, I can climb another 10 feet down, right? Yep, you climb another 10 feet down. All right. You could drop the rest of the way from there. Yeah, absolutely. Five feet from the bottom, which is not any falling damage. Cool. Good catch. After the cleric is the fighter. Going to make attacks on the shadow demon. Attack number one. That is a 29 to hit. 29 hits. 18 magical slashing. Second attack. 19 to hit. Yep. For 14 damage. Attack number three. That is a 25 to hit yep. for 10 damage. Action surge. Attack number four. 
That's a 1 to hit. No, thank you. That's a 22 to hit. Yep. 12 damage. Last attack is a 23. Hits. 10 damage. That will do it for me. After that, we're going to go to the Dark Elves. Dark Elf down here at the bottom, the Elite Warrior is going to help the Shadow Demon attack the fighter. This wizard's going to move invisibly to there and cast Lightning Bolt, targeting the Cleric. Give me a DC 14 Dexterity save. That's a 6. Cast at 4th level. Take 37 points of lightning damage. Spell save was an 18. Then this one is going to go to there. It's going to cast Misty Step to move to there. And it's going to hit you with Ray of Frost. Advantage because you can't see it because it's invisible. It's going to be a 25 to hit. Will hit. Take 9 points of cold damage and your movement speed is reduced by 10. Concentration save is 11. That'll pass. After that, we're going to go to the top of the order, Rogue. Am I over metagaming if I fairy fire the area where they just cast from? Absolutely not. You just saw two magical effects appear from that location. We are going to use my instrument of the bards to cast fairy fire. They need to make a DC 13. It is a 20-foot cube. Any creature in the area when the spell is cast is also outlined if it fails a dexterity saving throw. The northern drow gets an 18, the southern drow gets an 18. Okay, perfect. Then I will back up and use my bonus action to hide, and that is my turn. After that, we're going to go to the shadow demon. Shadow demon has advantage on this attack. It's going to get an 18 to hit you, which is not enough. After that, we go to the owl. He's going to dodge because there's nothing in his range that he sees. After the owl, we go to the wizard. Following suit with the rogue, I think I'm going to just spam fire an AoE in that direction. Let's go fireball scroll. DC 18 dex, 31. The northern one will fail with a 10. It'll take 31 points of damage and drop. The southern one will fail with an 11. It'll take 31 points of damage. DC 15 concentration save. It's going to get... I don't think that matters because you swapped the castings. So we're visible now. <laughs> After the wizard, we go to the cleric. Minus 10 feet of movement. You're down to 15. I wobble 15 feet towards the wizards, I guess. Can I see them? Yeah, it's going to have cover from the cliff face, but you can see it. Sacred flame. Fails. 18 damage. 18 is lethal. When the summoner dies, the demon dies. After the cleric, we go to the fighter. I'm going to attack the one remaining Dark Elf. First attack, that is an 18 to hit. I'm going to use my reaction to increase my AC to 21 for that attack. It will miss. Gotcha, just for that attack? Just for that attack. Second attack is a 23 to hit for 13 damage. Here's the concentration save. Passes with an 18. Third attack, that's a crit for 24 damage. 24 points of damage. The Dark Elf drops, the Darkness drops, and the encounter ends. Report hit points. 139 out of 139. 110 out of 110. 72 out of 138. 150 out of 172. Any pre-rest actions? I will use the Pearl of Power to get a third level slot back. Sounds good. Same. Anyone below half? Nope. The second and final short rest. Is anybody going to spend any hit dice? I spend my remaining six hit dice for 22 HP. I spend eight hit dice for 60 hit points. Any post-rest actions? Yeah, I'm going to swap my Pearl of Power for Winged Boots during the short rest. I'm going to swap out my Pearl of Power for the Boots of the Winter Winds. I'm going to recover third level two second level slots back. The eclectic group of defenders continues as the adventurers march ever deeper downward through the tunnels and on towards the next encounter, clearing out the lair of the eye beast and looting the place as they go. Hit points, ability, spells, items in hand. Holding a plus two longbow, using plus one arrows, having a instrument of the bard slung across my back, I have 139 out of 139 hit points. We have used the instance of fairy fire on the instrument of the bards. 110 out of 110 hit points. One charge on the wand of magic missiles. Four first level. Two second. Three third. Three fourth. Two fifth. The arcane recovery has been used. Currently at 138 hit points, I am holding the staff of python and shield plus two. Two level one. Two level two. Two level three. One level four. Two level five. And one level seven spell slot remaining. I have both charges of channel divinity. 172 of 172 hit points. We're carrying a great axe plus two. Toting around are two circlets of blasting, one on the head, one in the pocket. Second wind and action surge available, both uses of indomitable. And I've actually still got a javelin of lightning floating around that I have not used yet. Monsters, abilities, items, and numbers. This encounter has a tiger demon. Tiger demons are 
fiends that travel throughout the multiverse, manipulating as they see fit. They are vulnerable to piercing damage from magic weapons wielded by good creatures. That will apply to the rogue's arrows and the fighter's pike attack. They're otherwise immune to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage from non-magical attacks. They have a number of spellcasting abilities and they have claws. Their claws do a little bit of damage, but if they hit you, you are cursed. Spectating over this fight are two lesser eye beasts. Lesser eye beasts have a passive perception of 16 and a maximum perception of 26. So Rogue, you're gonna have to make those rolls. They can throw two eye rays at you. They can choose from confusion, paralysis, fear, and wounding. They can also reflect spells back at their casters if the spell misses them or if they succeed on their saving throw against it. Terrain. Terrain in this fight is much like the other fights. There's a couple of pieces of difficult terrain floating around. There's a bridge above you going across this chasm. Tactics. Any thoughts for tactics in this fight? I definitely want to get into close combat with that tiger demon. I'm going to swap over to my pike. You're going to have to do that in combat. I intend to do that. Can you guys deal with the lesser eye beasts? Give it the old college try. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to solo the tiger, so I would appreciate support fire from the rogue. One good sneak attack should obliterate the tiger demon. If we do obliterate it real fast, I'll circle back around and try and cover him. I would love a haste if wizard goes before me. That's the plan, I think, right at the beginning here. Let's go ahead and roll some initiative. Good job, tiger demon. Done did good. Anybody have higher than a 20? Oh, that's good to hear. Anyone have between a 15 and a 20? 20. 20.5. 20. 19 minus 1. You animal. 17 for the tiger demon. What do you got for me, fighter? 14. And what do you got for me, owl? 12. Well, Tiger Demon, you definitely tried. You got your numbers up there, but they weren't good enough. Wizard, what do you got? Haste on the fighter via a scroll. And that's a tunnel to the south or no? It's on a bridge. So there's a bridge right in front of you guys. And then there's a tunnel at the end of the bridge. Okay, yeah, I want to get under the bridge. After the wizard, we go to the rogue. Hang on, we're trying to figure out a way to hide and not get shot by eye beasts in the back. It's not going well. All right, bonus action. Click my heels, double my speed. Action. Use magic device, haste myself. So now my speed is ridiculous speed. 100? Yeah, yeah. Ludicrous. It takes me 18 squares, but go ahead and put me right there. That's a move, a standard, a bonus. I have a haste action that I can't really use. Can you dodge with it? I cannot take the dodge action, but I can take the hide action. Now that's a 25. Clear. Can we see the eye beast from here? You do not have it line of sight. They're up a cliff and then back into a tunnel. Okay. I'll chuck a Guiding Bolt at the Tiger Demon, first level. Limited magic immunity. The Tiger Demon cannot be affected or detected by spells of 6th level or lower unless it wishes to be. So it will choose not to be affected by that. I, oh, I can just dodge that. Okay, never mind. If that's the case, I bless myself the Fighter and the Wizard. I'll move forward my maximum speed. Tiger Demon's going to advance to there with his 40-foot move. He's going to throw a Dominate Person on the fighter can counter counter that with his immunity or no no it cannot he has a dc 18 wisdom saving throw this is a wisdom so advantage that's 12 we're gonna indomitable this that's a nine so we're gonna wind up taking it while the target is charmed i have a telepathic link with it i can use the link to issue commands and you do your best to obey you can use your action to take total and precise control over the target each time the target takes damage and makes a new wisdom saving throw against the spell. So he's going to instruct you to kill the wizard. If he starts to move towards me, I'll drop concentration. That's the tiger demon. Floating balls of fun. It's going to go down here, float downward, and blast the wizard. Wizard, give me a DC 13 constitution save versus wounding. It is a 16, sir. 16 will pass. You're going to take half of this. Half of 15 is 7. Concentration save. 12. Then he'll do a paralyzing ray on the... Cleric. Cleric, give me a DC 13 constitution versus paralysis. 16 plus 4, dirty 20. Dirty 20, that'll pass. This guy's going to float down over there. Same thing. Cleric, give me a DC 13 constitution versus paralysis. 13 plus 4, 17. 17 will do it. Wizard, DC 13 constitution versus wounding. C, 13 on the hit. Another 15 goes to 7. Another concentration save. 16. After that, we're going to go to the fighter. I have to advance towards the wizard. You advance towards the wizard. Wizard, what do you do? Drop concentration. And when haste ends... The target can't move or take actions until after its next turn as a wave of lethargy sweeps over it. I'm going to call it this one. After the fighter is the owl. Let's move in and aggravate the tiger over there for the rogue. After that, we're going to go to the wizard. Eye beast in the southwest here. It's going to fill some magic missiles. Fourth level. 
and that is a three. Three plus one is four, four plus five is nine, nine times six is 54, he drops. Let's move south, he said there's a tunnel there. There's a tunnel on top of the bridge, so you're underneath the bridge at the moment. You just want to back up into the corner or something? Yes. After the wizard is a rogue. We're going to move out and shoot the tiger demon with advantage. Crit. Good night. So, you one shot at a tiger demon. Yeah. How's it feel? It feels great. Just throw that out there. So that's 69 points of damage. First of all, nice. Second of all, it is vulnerable to magical piercing damage from good creatures. That's going to double up to 138. You broke the record. You blasted the record. You just one shot a tiger demon. <laughs> Fighter, you are no longer dominating. Yep. And you're hasted. I got things to do here, apparently. Places to be. <laughs> and demons to shoot. So let's go ahead and move behind the mushroom. Bonus action to hide. A 35 to hide from the eye beast. Man likes his 20s. Move forward one to the north and shoot at the eye beast. 30 to hit. 30 will hit. For 12 points of damage. I can only trigger sneak once per... Correct. So let's go ahead and move back behind the mushroom. After the rogue, we go to the cleric. I don't want to magic that thing. I'm just going to run up there and bonk it with my staff. Smart move. 19 to hit. 19 hits. I do a total of 12 damage. After the cleric, we go to the remaining balloon. Balloon is going to throw an attack at the wizard. Wizard, give me a DC 13 constitution save versus wounding. 12. I'm going to take full damage. You can take 17 points of necrotic damage. Cleric, give me a DC 13 constitution save versus paralysis. 17. 17 will pass. You are not paralyzed. I'm not going to eat the opportunity attack. I'm going to move on to the fighter. Close in on the eye beast. I finally get to contribute. Look, I tried to get you to contribute. Attack number one. That's a 13 to hit. 13 misses. Yeah, 13 probably misses. Second attack. That is a 22 to hit. Hits. For 18 damage. Drops. Way to go, fighter. Report hit points. 79. 139 out of 139. 138 out of 138. 172 out of 172. Any end of encounter actions? Does anyone want a unicorn? What? Sorry, a <laughs> unicorn? Like, to ride? Yeah, I could conjure less you. Okay, I have a magic pike. I could be the knight in shining armor just for <laughs> one day. If we have to choose from, like, core manual, it's either Koatoa or a unicorn. I think that's, like, the most useful, too. Uh, you mean Koatl, not Koatoa. <laughs> I was going to say, Koatl. <laughs> celestial Koatoa. You summon a Celestial of CR4 or lower. It's going to be a Pegasus, a Koatl. Oh, Unicorn's five. Maybe I was looking at Pegasus. Yeah, so you can have a Pegasus, which is a, a flying horse. Still badass. Or you can have a Koatl, which is a flying snake. But it's medium-sized, so you can't ride it. I can. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you going to cast it? Get the Koatl. Yeah, conjure Celestial and get a Pegasus. Oh, you want the Pegasus. Cool. Do you guys want Pegasus or Koatl? Pegasus is probably better. The Quaddle CR4. Actually, if nobody really needs to ride it, then we might as well bring the Quaddle. Yeah, bring the biggest hitting thing. I'll use my level 7 spell slot and get a Quaddle. On behalf of anyone who speaks Nahuatl and is listening, we apologize. Anybody else have anything that they want to do? Anybody need healing? Not really. I'm only missing 31. That's it. So, no. With their new divine snake friend in tow, the adventurers are going to make it into the end of the dungeon, the final lair of the Eye Beast. Confront it, kill it, and take all of its stuff. Hit points, ability, spells, items in hand. 79 hit points remaining. I have my Wand of the War Mage in my hand. Four first level slots. Three third, two fourth, two fifth. Holding plus two short bow, using plus one arrows. My instrument of the bards has fly, invisibility, levitate, protection from good and evil, entangle, shillelagh, and speak with animals still available. I've got two scrolls of haste left. I have 139 out of 139 hit points. Currently at 138 hit points. I have my Staff of Python and Shield plus 2 in hand. I have 1 level 1, 2 level 2, 2 level 3, 1 level 4, 2 level 5, and both charges of Channel Divinity. I have 172 of 172 hit points, carrying my Great Axe plus 2. I still have my Javelin of Lightning available, two Circlets of Blasting. I have Second Wind, Action Surge, and one use of Indomitable still available. Monsters, abilities, items, and numbers. A lot of stuff going on here. The Dreaded Eye Beast. Eye Beast has got armor. It's got the ability to hover for 20 feet. It has a passive perception of 22 and a maximum perception of 32. So you're going to have to make those rolls. They're immune to the prone condition as they float. 
primarily they have a main eye that has an anti-magic cone. Anti-magic cone has a 150 foot range. At the start of each turn, it decides which way it is looking. They can bite, which I would be very surprised I will ever do, and they have a number of eye rays. On its turn, it rolls 3d10, re-rolling duplicates, and those are the eye rays that it will shoot on its turn. The eye rays have a 120 foot range. They can charm, paralyze, fear, slow, enervate, telekinesis, sleep, petrify, disintegrate, or do death to a creature. They all have different abilities, they all have different saves, so we'll hit them when we hit them. Eye Beast has a legendary action. It can take three legendary actions. They're going to be at the end of your turns. The legendary action is to fire one of its eyes randomly like it normally does. You're fighting the Eye Beast in its lair, so at initiative 20, it has three lair actions it can do. It can open up a 50-foot square of difficult terrain on the ground. It can have the walls within 120 feet of it sprout grasping appendages and reach out to grapple you. It can open up a solid surface within 60 feet of it, and it can fire one of its random eye beams out. An anti-magic cone divorces the area from magical energy. Spells and magical effects are suppressed. This includes aid and hero's feast. When the effect is unsuppressed, your maximum goes back up, but your current does not. Oof. Yep, a spell slot that is suppressed when it is cast still takes this expended spell slot, but it doesn't function. Properties and powers of magic items are suppressed. For example, a plus two short bow would only function as a short bow. Summoned objects and creatures like, I don't know, quaddles or owls temporarily wink out of existence as long as the spot that they were in is in the zone. If I remember right, the eyes do not count as magic spells, right? They do. Do we know if it has resistance against non-magic weapons? It's not. It is immune to prone. That's the only resistance or immunity it has. Terrain and effects. Pretty standard for an IB slayer. It's a bunch of tunnels. There's a pool of water at the end of it. Pool of water is deep enough that the eye beast can submerge itself if it so chooses. The room has a 20 foot ceiling and the water is an additional 10 feet deep. Tactics, what do you guys think for tactics in this fight? So do we think we can draw it into the tunnels? Maybe. Yeah, it's probably gonna, when it can, use that layer action to shoot through the solid object. Well, yeah, but it can only do that once every two rounds. We still get a lot of value in drawing into the tunnels. This is maybe a peep and shoot sort of affair until and unless the beholder is willing to come into the tunnels, at which case we can get on all sides of it. Yeah, because I'm not going to be effective until we get out of that coal. Right, but as long as the rogue can peep and shoot from the southern tunnel, the beholder can't target us unless it spends its time readying. Can it ready multiple eye beams or can it only ready one? It's a single action to fire three of them. It is not a multi-attack, which is normally excluded from those sorts of abilities. I would say that it could fire all three. Rules is written, it seems like it could fire all three. So that actually doesn't work as well. The rogue could potentially get paralyzed on a readied counterattack. Yep. So I guess just get in there and spread? Well, no, because that central corridor is directly in front of it, so it's going to be able to keep that covered most of the time. So the wizard will have to be in the room and able to move in order to brawl with it. It's probably going to end up with me being able to dance around the cone. So I guess we just got to get in there and brawl. Yeah, and if we get near to the walls, one of us is probably going to get grappled. Yeah, it can only do that every other turn, and grapple doesn't impede us all that much. It's just, like, kind of annoying. Cleric, I'm probably going to take a lot of damage this round. Due to over channel. Yeah, I got healing spells ready, hopefully. I got, like, six, seven spell slots ready for healing, and then I have, like, potions and uh, scrolls. I'm waiting to see how big this cone is. 150 feet, it's massive. That's kind of what I'm waiting for, too. If that's the case, then magic just basically doesn't function in front of this guy. Especially in this... Yeah, and like I said with the, when I was asking about the eyes, if the melee wants to keep in front of it at all times, that's probably the best because you can avoid the beams that way. Yeah. I'm just going to be chucking spears at this thing. 150 foot cone, Jesus. Well, if you need a third crown, I've got one. What would I do with the crown? I'm not going to be able to cast with it. Throw it at him? It's one of those moments where I wish alchemical bombs were really a thing in D&D. Can somebody give me a summary of the tactics you guys decided? Brawl. There's no ability to use magic while on ground. There's no way that we can deny him the anti-magic field because it's so huge and the ground is so limited. So it's basically just protect the rogue and brawl. Let's do it then. Roll up initiative. Anybody have higher than a 20? Quado has a 22. Anybody have between a 20 and a 15? The Eye Beast has a 17. Oh. Who's got between a 15 and a 10? Rogue has a 14. 14 on the wizard. 11 on the fighter. 6. A 2. Top of the order, Snake. What does Snake do? A Snake has got a dash. Fly 90 feet. To behind the Beholder. Okay, cool. It moves into the zone and it disappears. Oh, wait. It starts out pointing forward. Okay, now. Yeah. First layer action we're going to do is an Eye Beam. 
I rolled a 9, which is a disintegration ray. Cleric, give me a DC 16 dexterity save. That's a 9. Take 48 points of force damage. At the lair is the eye beast. The eye beast is going to advance. We just move forward for 20 feet. Can't see anybody, so we might as well dash. That puts everybody in the zone. The owl blinks out for the moment. Aid and Hero's Feast both drop. Fighter, can you tell me how many hit points you lose? I have been miscounting my total HP this whole time. It should have been 182. I was at 172. 18 HP that I just lost. Rogue, do you lose 28 hit points? Yes. Cleric, do you lose 28 hit points? No, I only lose 9. Wizard, do you lose 28 hit points? No, because I'm below my maximum already. So do you lose any? Nope. You are already 28 points lower. I was at 79 out of 86. That's the eye beast. After that is the rogue. Ugh. Let's go ahead and move as many squares as I can directly east and then take the hide action. That'll be 10 to there. One southwest, because then I have something to hide behind. 25. 25 will do it. Pass perception 22. After that is the legendary action. He doesn't have line of sight to anybody, so the legendary action isn't going to do anything. After that, we go to the wizard. My best bet is to go to the southeast as far as I can and call dodge. Heading for that south tunnel. After that is the legendary action. Doesn't have anybody you can see, so he doesn't do anything. Fighter. I will move my full 12 spaces as close to him as I can on the north corridor, and then tuck me into the wall if I can avoid line of sight there. Yeah, you definitely avoid line of sight. Another legendary action that is not available. The owl is gone. Cleric. Dash me 10 spaces to the northeast. You good there? As long as I'm out of line of sight. Yeah, you are. After the cleric is the snake. Snake still gone. After the snake is the lair. 50 foot square of ground becomes slimy. The area is difficult terrain until next initiative count of 20. 50 foot square area. Wow. That's huge on this map. Yep. Yeah, this is a tough map. Slime appears underfoot. After the lair, we go to the eye beast. We're not going to close the beam, but it's going to move to there. So he's going to rotate the beam like that. Owl comes back. The snake comes back. Cleric and fighter, your magical abilities return. And we're going to start blasting. I got a fear ray, I got a slowing ray, and I got a sleep ray. Throw the sleep ray against the fighter. Give me a DC 16 wisdom save. Advantage on this because Hero's Feast is now active once more. 15. Oh, I'm gonna let it lie. Sleep isn't that bad. I have a cloak of protection, which puts me at 16. The next one is gonna be a fear ray. Give me a DC 16 wisdom save versus fear. Immune to poison or being frightened. Thank you. Forgot that one. So seldom relevant. And the slowing ray is gonna go after the cleric. Give me a DC 16 dexterity save. 19. You pass, you're not affected by it. That's my eye beast. After that is the rogue. I would like to move behind the cleric. Your abilities return. Yep. Bonus action, hide. Still check as a 25. You make it. I do. With advantage to Plink and Eye Beast. 22 to hit, because all my stuff is on and active. 22 connects. Unfortunately, it's a weak roll. 38 points of damage. 38 eye. Get it. You have a legendary action you want to shoot me with? If you're done with your turn. I'm going to move back behind my rock. Into the zone. I have a legendary action. I'm going to use it. Telekinetic Ray. Quaddle, please give me a DC 16 strength save. Plus 317. That will pass. It does not get pushed around. After that, we're going to go to the wizard. Keep moving south here. Stop short of the little bend there. After the wizard, we have a legendary action. It's a 1. Charm Ray. Fighter, give me a DC 16 wisdom save versus charm. Hey, that's a 21. All right, that'll make it. After my legendary action, we go to the fighter. I'm going to fly into the air to skip over this difficult terrain. So go ahead and move my full distance and dash to get adjacent to the eye beast. And then we're going to action surge. See how he likes it. Attack number one. That is a 23 to hit. 23 hits. 19 damage. Attack number two. Ew. 17 to hit. 17 will miss. Punches into the natural armor, but does not break skin. Attack number three. 25 to hit, 10 damage. You good? Yeah, I'm not gonna do any bonusy stuff. After the fighter is a legendary action, three. Three is another fear ray. DC 16 wisdom save versus, and you're still immune to fear. I'm an idiot. Okay, cool. <laughs> After the legendary action is the owl. Moving forward behind the cleric, I guess. And dodge. Cleric. I am also going to click my heels and fly. I'll put you there. You can remain in the air with flying boots. You can use the boots to fly for up to four hours. If you're flying when the duration expires, you descend at a rate of 30 feet per... I will throw a spiritual weapon at level 5 behind the eye. Excellent position. 30-20 to hit. 30-20 hits. For 16 damage. And your action action? A dodge. After that, we go to the snake. Quado's gonna fly straight at the eye beast. Maximal 90 feet. Adjacent or 
not adjacent. Adjacent. Okay. And then it disappears. That's the end of the snake. After that is the lair. Shoot an eye beam at you. It's a fear ray. The fear ray is shot at the fighter. The fighter is immune to it. That's the lair action. After the lair action is the eye beast. Eye beast is going to look... We're going to look straight forward. Pal is gone. Spiritual weapon ends or... It's not in the beam. Excellent patient, like I said before. Then we're going to move. Uh, we're going to stay right there. No, please, move. <laughs> we're going to roll three rays. I got a four. Slowing ray. Fighter, give me a DC 16 dexterity save versus slow. Now that's a nine. I'm slowed. Your speed is halved. You cannot take reactions. You can take either an action or a bonus action, but not both. And you can repeat the save at the end of each of your turns. The next one is a telekinesis. Give me a DC 16 strength save versus telekinesis 19 19 you'll pass you're not hit by telekinesis and then finally the death ray give me a dc 16 dexterity save 10 you get indomitable can i find out what the death ray does before i indomitable it absolutely it's gonna do 10 d10 necrotic damage you die if reduced to zero now nah, it's fine gamble all right it does 100 necrotic i'm just kidding <laughs> My deck save is plus one here. It's just not the good save for Indomitable. Take 56 points of necrotic damage. You still up? I'm still over 100. That's gross. That was my eye beast. You don't have a reaction, so I'm gonna move, and that will drop the hammer. After the eye beast, we go to the rogue. Ah, I think you're just out of range. 110 feet out. Less 25. Yeah, just outside. Yeah, so you can plank it with a dash, but that's it. Ah, uh, being a stunty is terrible. Sure, let's go ahead and dash as a bonus action. Go ahead and hide behind that rock. 25. After the rogue is the legendary action. Legendary actions will not be effective this round. After that, we go to the wizard. Just below the bin there if I dash. Fighter. Am I slowed? Yeah. Am I? Oh, no. So this is going to be weird. We're doing a little bit of a dragon grapple again. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm not currently slowed. But you'll become slowed. I would like to run and jump to the Beholder. Yeah, sure. And then we're going to grapple the Beholder. <laughs> Absolutely. Give me a athletics. That's a 13. 13 is better than his four. Whew. So what does he now do? He's grappled. Zero movement. He can hover. He is not restrained. Well, there's a difference. My next question is, what do I now do? Since that's one of your attacks in your attack action. One of your hands is occupied grappling him. So you cannot use a two-handed weapon. Do you have a one-handed weapon? No. It's going to be a punch attack then. That's fine. We'll have to catch up with the other question in a minute, which is what happens to me when I am floating in midair and <laughs> grappling? Punch attack is... You have to roll to hit first. 13 to hit. 13 a miss. And that's a 16 to hit. 16 a miss. You good? Hanging on to the I-Beast. At the end of your turn, you're going to save against slow again. DC 16. Nope. Yeah, I rolled a five. Still slow. No one is targetable for the legendary action. Cleric. Run me ten spaces straight at the Beholder. That's my turn. The lair action. Walls within 120 feet of the eye beast sprout grasping arm appendages. Each creature of its choice that starts its turn within 10 feet of the wall must make a dexterity save. All right, so we'll do that. The eye beast. Can't move. My move into zero. Uh, I, I, the eye the eye. <laughs> I can't look at you. I can't move. You guys are all worried about this fight, but you've done really well for yourselves. Uh, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, I have to get it off the fight. Okay, so this is, that's the, no, that, that's the best bet. We're gonna rotate it. Owl, still gone. Quaddle pops. Warhammer pops. We're gonna blast eye beams at the fighter. Great. We got a telekinesis ray, petrification ray, death ray. Fighter, give me a DC 16 strength save versus telekinesis. 21. 21. I needed you to fail that. You failed the task I assigned to you. Look, when did I ever succeed at anything you expected of me? Petrification. Make a DC 16 dexterity save versus petrification. That is a 15. On a failed save, you begin to turn to stone and you are restrained. You must repeat the saving throw at the end of your next turn. On a success, the effect ends. On a failure, you are petrified until freed by greater restoration. And then finally, the death ray. DC 16 dexterity save. And 12. 61 points of necrotic damage. Meh. But I'm still grappled, so I cannot move. You just put a weight on you. That's my <laughs> eye beast rogue. Go ahead and move south three. Give me a DC 15 dexterity save versus the arms grappling you. Halfling luck. 24. The shot on the eye beast. Why are you for going hiding? To get your magic stuff? It is a fair block of damage. That's a net one, which we're going to halfling luck into a 32. 42 points of damage. Bonus action to click my heels and then go towards the quaddle and then tuck behind the cleric with my last move. Cheeky. After that, we go to the legendary action. The legendary action is to blast the fighters, the only person I can see. Seven is a sleep ray. DC 16 wisdom, and you have advantage because of Hero's Feast. Yep. 
not gonna get the job done, and now I am going to use Indomitable. 18. Truly indomitable. After that, we go to the wizard. <laughs> DC 15 dexterity versus grapple. Sure. No problem. 17. 17 will do it. Shatter with over channel at level 5. Over channel does what? Maxes the damage. 3d8 normally. 1d8 extra for every third. So it's going to be 68. 68 maximized. 48 plus 5. So it's going to be 53 damage. What's the DC? DC 18. Caught. I'm going to get a 19 to save against this. Ah. Oh. Okay. That's going to push 53 down to a 26. It was worth the risk. You good there? Yeah, I'm good. After that is the legendary action. I got a 1, which is a charm ray. Fighter, please give me a DC 16 wisdom save versus charm. 16. That'll do it. After that, we're going to go to the fighter. We're going to throw another creature on the field. I'm going to crack an air elemental gem. It's this or gem of brightness right in its eyes. <laughs> Would be funny. Would be hilarious. And I'm going to drop it directly behind. Initiative count. 22. Am I able to move? Because I have flying boots. Yeah, you can move at half speed while you drag it along with you. I want to drag it two spaces to the west. Sorry, I am slow. In which case, I can move into the beam first. I'm sorry, yeah, no, I need the winged boots. One square, and then move one space north. That's as much dragging as I can do. Okay. Then a legendary action. Fear Ray on the wizard. I'm immune to fear. Al is still gone. Cleric, you are not within range of a wall. A step southeast one space. Oh, get me out of the zone. Greater Restoration, my last fifth level slot on the fighter. Spell has no effect in the anti-magic field. Oh, right. Bonus action. Bonus action, use the spiritual weapon to hit the beholder. Move the hammer behind the thing again. 28 to hit for 14 damage. Use my flying to the south east corner of the beholder. After the cleric is the snake. A snake is gonna fly around from the south. I can do the constrict attack. Plus 6 to hit, reach 10 foot. 21 to hit. It's immune to this because the target is not a medium or smaller creature. Oh. Anything else? That's it. Air elemental. We're gonna use our slam attack. So move forward the one space into contact. Attack number 1. That's a 27 to hit. Hits. 15 damage. Lethal. Exactly what you needed. Adventurers have laid waste to the eye beast. They ravaged through its lair, picking up all of its loot. In the loot, they're going to find 42,000 gold, which comes out to 10,500 gold each. They find a suit of plus one plate armor. They find a wand of lightning bolts. They find a potion of invisibility and a potion of supreme healing. After this, the adventurers are going to head off to loot the vampire crypt in a neighboring barony. By tradition, what did you guys think was the easiest encounter? Assassins? Yeah. 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 My notes for this encounter are no notes. What made this easy? You lost the initiative roll. Yeah, that's it. If we didn't get that, it would have been a different fight. Yeah, I had this set up assuming the two things. Number one, I didn't ace the stealth check. I think if you didn't know where they were, you would have to start exploring. But you're like, well, we know he's down there. We're just going to ready for him to come out and get us. Yeah. Assassins are supposed to be a surprise character. We don't use surprise mechanics in this, but if we did, I think that's what should have happened there. And then number two is like, as soon as you knew where he was, he's like, okay, well, that guy's a goner. My thought was that I was going to ready actions to attack you guys as you went to explore them. So they would always get the sneak attack, but it didn't pan out that way. They also don't have a lot of hit points. They're pretty squishy and you guys do some pretty significant damage, all of you. Longfish, do you agree? Something else was easier? No, this was definitely the easiest fight. Like The fifth fight, would, the outcome was easier, but we planned a lot more than the third one. I think this one's pretty straightforward. Once you do double damage, vulnerable to magical piercing weapons wielded by good characters, and the rogue is like, oh yeah, cool, I got this. I'm going to crit this guy. I'm going to one-shot him. That was a little bit of dice magic, and if he had stayed on the field longer, he might have been a problem, but the joy of vulnerability in 5e meant that he exploded. The fourth one wasn't all that difficult either. The only challenge that this really had for us was the chasm. Once we engaged with things, they pretty much all just died. I think the challenge here was the casters, and then you threw up globe of invulnerability and that removed the challenge sure yeah one spell kind of obviated everything else and then the guy who dropped darkness and let me pound on him in a corner he isolated himself and he could get no ally support my thought was i was going to bait you off into the corner and i wouldn't have to deal with you like none of the casters had to deal with a fighter pounding on their face grappling them holding them still saying hey it's over here that's what i wanted is for you to run off and then he just distracted you for several turns you think your maneuvers over there were the right ones to make or did you think that in retrospect, you're like, well, I kind of wasted my actions. The only actions that I wasted were I pounded on the demon and then he went and got unsummoned anyway. You know, if I hadn't sort of just wasted that time, then I might have gotten 
hit by some of the casters because I was exposed. I didn't really need to show up for this one. I just went off in the corner and distracted the one demon from supporting his casters so that they could get hosed down. The demon's vulnerable to radiant damage, so I was not about to run into that Spear Guardians. Mm. Any other thoughts about what made these fights easy? A lot of them were messy. Like, we were talking about why does this feel like it's taking so long? What, what have messy, you? Messy, messy, messy. Messy in what way? What do you mean? Lots of buttons. So there was a lot of a lot going on in those fights, to, to quote that terribly, right? You have the fights where there's a caster involved in every fight here. There's a lot of tactical positioning involved in each of the fights, and there's a lot of special rules being thrown around, and there's a lot of weird line of sight to consider, and it's fine. I'm not complaining. A lot of these are great. They're fun. They're tactical. As a GM, I know that there's some serious cognitive load going on some of these, and I wouldn't run a, I would have been gun shy about a couple of these. Which would you be hesitant to run? I would not have run the single Beholder Encounter. And this is the other one I probably would have modified or scrubbed, just because there's a lot of tactical positioning and stuff moving around. And I was like, oh, you've got to manage the Eye Beasts, you've got to manage the Giants, and you've still got to play around with rough terrain. Like, I would have derped this. I know me. I would have made mistakes here. And the consequence of which is it's too easy for the players? If I freely allow the giants to walk over terrain they're not supposed to. It's one of those things that I feel could be really swingy and go either way. I know it's an encounter that I would have messed up. I want to ask you about the hardness encounter, but I'm imagining it's the eye beast. Does somebody feel differently about it? I didn't go down in the eye beast encounter, but I did in the second one. Yeah, you got rocked by the giants. But do you think that the second one was actually harder? Hard to say. Like, I think that you could have run the last encounter a lot more difficult. Really? If you had, it would have been a very boring fight. Very visually boring to watch. So I think that the last one has the most potential to be the most difficult. What could have made this fight more difficult? I think this is the first time I've ever run an eye beast as a DM. I can't think of any other time where I've done it. Certainly the first time in 5th edition where I've used Lair actions. I'm just straight up unaware of the tactics to use to run this guy effectively. And also there's a certain amount of like counterplay that shows up. So what opportunities do you think I missed here to make this more difficult for you? Given that we have a, a large portion of our damage output is magic based with the cleric and the wizard, most particularly because you have this big pool of head height water. Pulling the eye beast back and having him basically sweep off in order to fire beams at us and then sweep back on to suppress during our turn, he can suppress all of the solid ground at the same time. It's going to be difficult for us to approach him. The rogue has the ability to hit things effectively under the beam, which means I think the rogue is the first target. But he can probably sweep off to target the rogue and then sweep back on to keep suppressing the wizard. On his turn, at the start of his turn, he has to direct the beam somewhere. Probably ran it improperly. The IB central eye creates an area of anti-magic in a 150-foot cone. At the start of its turn, it decides which way the cone faces and whether the cone is active. So under that interpretation, I could decide that the cone is here and then move the eye beast to here. It just says it's an area. It doesn't say that the area follows the eye beast. It doesn't say that it's directly coming out of the eye, right? It just says the central eye creates an area of anti-magic. So I assumed it followed the eye beast around, but it can't turn to face somewhere else with it after the start of its turn. So I would love to go turn away, blast everybody, turn back towards you, nullify all of your magic, right? That'd be great, but I can't do that. And so the best I could do was like, you can do this kind of like jump forward, blast the guy behind you, jump backwards so that he's in the zone again. But that's really kind of finicky. I still think generally like suppressing most of the walkable land area is going to give you a lot of value, especially with the lair actions. You can cover one half of the land area and drop difficult terrain on the wizard so that he can't get to the uncovered area where the rogue is. But yeah, just being able to suppress basically all of the walkable terrain means that like it's pretty difficult to get to the eye beast in the first place. Yeah, if I had stayed back here. Yeah, like slide that up 10 feet and he's got pretty much everything. Well, you can go for a swim, that's fine. And then you fly and you're fine with that. Then as we saw, I'm taking all of the eye beams and we keep the rogue suppressed and we keep the cleric and the wizard suppressed. I don't know that it necessarily changes the outcome, but it would have been a giant pain. The cleric is going to do the same thing, right? He's going to make it because he's got winged boots and then you guys are going to flank, which you guys figured out pretty well. It's like, we'll put them on opposite sides. Asia Wolf, was this the hardest? No, I don't think it was. I think it could have been, but I don't think it was. I think this one had the most to do, the potential to do the most damage. What did you think was hardest? I have to agree. 
it's the giant one. So what made this one difficult for you? It's the Fear of the Rocks, because that range is kind of disgusting. 60, 240. 12 squares is not a lot to me, but all right, I hear you. This one is the one that actually dropped somebody, even if he was doing his HP right. I think it still would have dropped them, right? Maybe not. Might have had one or two HP left. The one where you actually dropped someone, so I felt like this one had the more... We were still getting used to the little IB type things. That could have been it, too. But yeah, this one felt... The harder one for me, anyways. Blind Oracle, your preference? This had the highest incoming damage potential, which automatically makes it a resource suck, which leads to the idea that it is a little harder, but they all felt about even to me as the rogue. This was a great dungeon to just plink away at. It was pretty cool. You guys have a Life Cleric. Obviously, there's caveats and addendums and asterisks to this, but Life Cleric can potentially restore 140 hit points per short rest, which pushes it up to 420 hit points over the course of a dungeon. Obviously, you're not going to get that, but that's the potential of that ability. Is a large damage output actually dangerous? Does it actually make it difficult? Because you're just like, all right, cool, I spend an action, everything you've done this turn is undone. It still matters, right? Something like this particular encounter that is a big resource suck has more impact if it's in a different place. So this is just before a short rest, so we have more tools that are available. If this is like encounter three or encounter five, it becomes a little scarier. We were pretty good on our management this time around. Even I was like, oh wow, I still got quite a bit going into that last fight. This is something I realized about like magic items in the sort of game. Static modifiers are really strong because the action economy very much clamps you to what you can and can't do. The fighter went through this entire dungeon without throwing any of his circlets of blasting. He could have bought 20 of them. Each time he's like, actually, my role is better if I'm running up and hitting things with an axe. That's going to do more over the long run. So I don't think the gas tank is really a metric of how hard or easy something is because it very much comes down to the action economy. How many can you actually apply? Combats generally go on for about three three to four, four rounds per combat. So that's 24. 24 spells is probably all of your stuff. So maybe that's, that's counter to my argument. But I feel like a lot of the time you have spells at the end, but a lot of the spells that you have are levels that don't really matter for damage application. So I think a lot of it too is because we do a straight six and we're not doing like RP stuff in the middle too. That's where a lot of our stuff would be used for like the detect magics detect magic is a ritual for those type of spells though things for like that that you'd be using in between like the travel time zone of truth is one that pops to mind from the strict design standpoint encounters can include utility challenges the intended design included utility challenges things that you might spend your spells on that were not combat and that that was built into the six to eight encounter design that's what i was getting at is it's because like you've used to spell magic or stuff like that on things that are going on in the dungeon as you're crossing it that's why we're having a lot more left over it certainly could be that social and skill encounters are included in the six to eight encounter design i don't know that's necessarily true but it, it might be I believe they are. I don't know that that's necessarily true. I think they're talking about combat encounters. The first encounter was a lightning lizard and two lesser ibis. Tactics here were don't get eaten, protect the simulacrum so it can unload spells early, and convince them to leave the cave. Convince them to leave the cave, I think that was fear. How would you convince them to leave the cave, knowing that they can throw eye beams and they can shoot lightning out of their mouth? How did you get them to leave the cave? The idea, I think, was to pull back into cover so that they had to come out of the cave in order to target. And that is essentially what they did. The Bahir advanced in order to use the lightning, and we can see that the lesser eye beast came all the way out into the middle. We did give them some better targets of opportunity, but those were pretty much just the cleric and the fighter. So that was how we drew them out, was deny them targets unless they are close enough for us to respond. Asia Wolf, this is the second time you've run with a simulacrum. How should it be used based on your experience so far? In our version of a campaign where you're doing a straight six and you can't prep for stuff. It's just a glass cannon. It's a throw as much as you can down range. So to be clear, there is prep available in between. Whether or not yeah, you no, do no, it no, is yes, a completely uh, yeah, separate like, issue. But. No, what I, what I mean by that is like, that's where Simulacrum really shines when you can prep for like the big boss with it. And so you have time to spend that time to cast a spell to get ready for that fight where us, we're doing a straight sit. Can I ward in bomb the Simulacrum? Yeah, I don't see why not. Pretty much, it's a glass cannon. It's there to, it's dynamite. Do as much as you can before you blow up. <laughs> 
if I warding bond him, it will last it at least another round. And with the simulacrum on the field, he's not going to target a wizard first place anyway. Yeah, I mean, with the simulacrum on the field, I'm not going to target anybody except the simulacrum. The simulacrum cannot be healed. He's dumping his highest level spells first because, of course, he is. What about the tactic of holding him as far back as possible and throwing buff spells at people? I think haste has a 30-foot range, so you could hide him out of line of sight and hit one of your allies with haste and then just sit on it as a concentration bot. You have to be in line of sight to throw your attack spells back. You don't have to be in line of sight to buff your allies. Would it be better to be throwing buff spells or is it still get as much damage downrange as possible? I never thought of like the actual buff thing with... My opinion about buffs in 5e is they're either constant things which are great, they're like aid, hero's feast is incredible, but in combat buffs that you have to maintain concentration are generally not great. In the case of the simulacrum, he can carry one concentration spell that effectively doubles the wizard's concentration abilities, but the buffs themselves, it's not worth having to sit him in a corner and have him do nothing to get one haste off per encounter. And if he's going to cast one haste and then start popping out to throw down damage, we're in the same boat. He's going to get more value out of just throwing down damage. There aren't a lot of spells that are worth it in pure damage output over what he did, which was drop a disintegrate for 100 damage right off the bat. Like, there's no buff spell that's going to do anything for the fighter or the rogue that's going to be worth 100 damage to just keep him in the corner. So I have a thought. What if, like, we reverse the spell casting, like the pre-casting sequence? Wizard casts Simulacrum first, and then I cast Aid and Hero's Feast. Simulacrum cannot gain hit points. It's based off of me, that's the thing. That's the trick here. The best thing I can do is to just put a warding bond on it. I'm not going to condone this, but you could make an argument that the cleric casts Hero's Feast, and everybody consumes it, then they sit on it for 12 hours while the wizard casts Simulacrum, and then the Simulacrum has its hit points determined by the new wizard amount, which gives them a couple more hit points. And then you guys go off to adventure after waiting around for 12 hours. I don't like that interpretation. I think it's dumb. Honestly, if we wanted to keep the simulacrum alive, we have the cleric put warding bond on the simulacrum, and then we find a way to get the simulacrum false life. Ooh, nice. That's how you do that. I'm pretty sure you can give them temp HP, because it doesn't count as a heal. It's a construct. I don't know if that changed anything. Cannot regain HP. You have to go spin stuff to repair. It. You shape an illusory duplicate of one beast or humanoid that is within range for the entire casting of the spell. Should it be the wizard? Yeah. What about the cleric? The cleric's a decent option, but especially an evocation wizard with that damage maxing ability, he just puts down more damage than anybody else is going to in the short time that he's here among us. Blind Oracle, you're probably familiar with the concept of a distraction carnifex. Oh yes. Would it be good to make a full plate wearing, shield bearing, dodging fighter clone simulacrum no because no hear me out as to why the wizard is scary and you have to deal with it it costs us nothing if it dies yes we're talking about maximizing keeping it alive but that's only to make you work that much harder to kill something that is inconsequential resource burn to us it's a seventh level spell slot it only has 42 hit points when it's on the wizard you guys could up that by casting warding bond on it yeah and give it haste it's a little more armor but the armor isn't really the thing that's going to do it fighter what's your naked hit points uh, 158 75 hit point ac 20 resistance from warding bond disadvantage to hit because it's dodging or it just runs up next to people you don't want a person that just runs up next to people and gives you sneak attack no matter where you are would you actually fight it <sighs> exactly my point is i probably wouldn't fight it he already has someone to do that well then you get two of them right you can't be in all places at all times i'm pretty good at getting sneak for myself though yeah and there's a couple in the last fight i think that you were like i'm struggling to find it i think you found it in a lot of cases but i think there's a couple of rounds where you were like well this is a dash and hide round rather than a shoot round yeah, and sometimes I've been doing the dash and hide round, though, so that I set for survivability purposes, it is better to be able to hide at the end of a turn. So if I burn the first turn getting in position to just play rocket tag with you in, from a position of safety the whole time, that's really powerful. Second one. Spirit Guardians, the Eastern Gap. You can't choke point the eye beast. Focus fire on the giant first. Eye beasts don't do much. Haste the fighter or the cleric, and the rogue also has haste. I really liked hearing that the IBs don't do much because it let me get free reign to burst down the simulacrum. In hindsight, was that the right move to call them not problematic or should they have been targeted? They probably should have been targeted, but like, like I said, I think we were still getting used to them because once we got to the, the one with the bridge, they were kind of the afterthought because, I mean, I took one down in one round and the fighter basically 
did the same on the next, I think. I don't think we could have reasonably expected the simulacrum to stay much more than two fights, just because he's he's so exposed to damage, and he's just such an obvious priority target. Like, he's the highest priority even over the wizard, because he's going to go down and take a lot more potential resources with him. Ultimately, there's only so much we can do to protect that simulacrum. Getting, you know, 100 damage out of him on the first fight probably was worth the seventh level spell. Anything we got after that was gravy, and we did get a little out of him, I think, on this turn. Plus, you know, drawing attacks off of our wizard. I do have a bone to pick on this one. When I went down, Longfish decided to engage the giant, let me lie for one turn, and then move close enough to use his channel divinity. Zeros and Zeros usually, like, if somebody went down and you rest them on the spot without them having a chance to stand up, he's just gonna walk over and, like, advantage stomp on you. Sure. In this case, one, I think the turn order would break down in my favor, so I'd be able to move before he could. And two, you could have used the healing word as a bonus action, so it wouldn't hurt your action economy. And the trade-off there was one first level cleric spell for potentially three fighter attack, because I would get up, close, and go for three attacks, and I was still hasted. So three fighter attacks is worth more damage and probably utility than that first level spell will ever be. And because you were giving yourself time to close the distance for the channel divinity, while Saracen will often re-engage with somebody who gets back up, there's no ongoing consequence to getting knocked down again. As long as I come back up, you've gained in the action economy with that single spell, and we've still got the channel divinity later at the short rest. There's very seldom a reason to hold that first level spell unless the particular action breakdown is bad, and even then, you're burning a giant's attack to take like 7 HP off of somebody. <laughs> As Longfish has mentioned, this is not how I play. I don't attack people when they're making death saving throws. No, you attack people when I arrest them. Yep, absolutely. I will 100% do that. But if the DM does attack people who are making death saving throws, you want to get it out even faster. GMs will just hit people while they're on the ground, and a multi-attack to a downed character is basically a death sentence. Any other thoughts about this one? I should have opened with a ready gem against the eye beast rather than going in and trying to use the gem on a giant. That was just an obviously poor decision. <laughs> he didn't like that 10 to con save. I should have readied a gem against the eye beast knowing that, you know, that is not their strong suit. I had pretty much the same thing in the previous fight as well. Being blinded would be bad for them. It's not completely turning them off. They could make attacks at disadvantage. The eye beast, I think they have to see their target to do anything at all. This fight also proved to take that shot at range to disadvantage even if you got to this fight was split up cover the doors mob them after you find them haste the fighter with scrolls i gotta say the moment you said split up and i was like yes this is it the assassin's gonna get somebody and then we didn't split up <laughs> that made me sad we did a little bit but we really didn't have the room to go anywhere <laughs> spirit guardians really did the trick here they only moved 30 so being able to stand spirit guardians for front and also being immune to poison a lot of their damage it's like 7d6 poison damage all of which is ignored they get 5d6 from their attack and their sneak attack if they get sneak attacks eat poison for breakfast Hero's Feast was really the one that made this kind of trivial. Yeah. It's one of those I learned to use in one of my other games and looked at it kind of a couple of times sideways like, eh, it's all right. And then once I used it, I was like, no, this is amazing. <laughs> Well, it's good in our format because you get a lot of work out of it. I've been in games where people are just like, we're going to do, you know, the 15 minute work day and spending 1500 gold on a 15 minute work day is definitely not worth it because you're not getting the return. You're throwing 100% of the recommended level gold at us per dungeon. So we have a lot more gold available per dungeon, whereas a classically running operation would either have a longer dungeon with multiple days or they would have multiple dungeons per level to spend that money on. For us, Heroes Feast is just one and done. Any other thoughts about the Assassins? You think you guys cleaned their clock pretty well. This one, the only notes I have are cork the bottle, get across the chasm, and go south. Is corking a bottle with somebody who has darkness, somebody who has crossbows, and someone who can throw lightning bolts a really good idea? It is if you've got a globe of vulnerability. I felt safe in my little bubble up here. <laughs> This was the encounter for it, right? This is the encounter that said, we have spells. And you're like, great, you don't have spells anymore. Glover and Vulnerability does the thing. And initiative helped a lot. I was curious why the cleric went climbing down rather than winged boots across. I haven't switched yet. During the fourth rest, he switched from Pearl of Power to winged boots. Oh, I see, I see. 
Tiger Demon. One of my favorite monsters in the Monster Manual. Since I saw them playing Baldur's Gate 2. There's one Tiger Demon in Baldur's Gate 2, and it's like a half of a quest. I loved it. I thought it was great. I thought it was absolutely wonderful. They're so cool. I liked them in 3.5. Didn't play a lot of fourth. I'm kind of disappointed in them in fifth. I gotta say, Tiger Demon did not do what I wanted Tiger Demon to do. I think it's a great RP monster. I think it's absolutely terrifying in a role-playing setting, but in a combat, didn't do as well as I would have hoped. Dice luck. Honestly, if the Tiger Demon had stuck around for the round, or the Tiger Demon and I had to play tag a little longer, easily would have made things a bit more complicated for us. Going delete was pretty powerful. Blowing your turn with the Tiger Demon on controlling the fighter, and then the fighter just getting turned off. That was rough. Yeah, yes I know. Like, those are the right tactics to use. I suppose preemptively hasting the fighter in case they get turned is not the right tactic. Like, (laughs) that's just gonna make your allies mad at you. But hey, I'm doing this as an insurance policy so that I can disable you anytime I want. Probably not the way to make friends. I've used the haste tactic, that haste tactic, on enemies before, where I've given to the NPCs or the guys we're fighting, and it doesn't happen all the time, but yeah, it's kind of fun to be able to like i just turn it off now <laughs> although you also lose your turn in casting it so it's kind of a trade-off but then the rest of the team gets their turn and so it's not as bad. an enemy has to be willing to accept it i think it has to be targeting a willing creature and once you've done that on a dm they're aware of what you're gonna do you can get away with it once <laughs> that gets back to the whole thing about if you don't tell them what the spell is you're right you can pull one over but then the correct move for the dm is to read every spell that the player casts and that just slows down the game unnecessarily so that's a short-term gain for a long-term loss i will say in regards to tiger demons my understanding is they are probably the greatest social villain they are not a combat encounter villain they are probably the greatest social villain for a campaign that can be had they're magic immune they're ridiculously hard to identify and then to defeat They're a great social campaign villain, but they're just not really intended as combat encounters except for that one fight. One of the ways that Tiger Demons become a real combat challenge is when there is another big problem, minions and a Tiger Demon or two, because now you have an embedded caster that every turn is going to play Shuffle the Cup and do things like, I'm going to charm the fighter again. I'm going to make the big bad guy invisible. I'm going to throw up a major image. I'm going to suggestion. They do not stand up as the single solitary bad guy or as the driving bad guy on the back end. Using them to spice up a challenge rating 15 is just chef kiss good. Why are you giving him ideas? A lot of casters are in that boat. They're not able to stand on their own. You can't put them as the single foe, but if you put them as the supplement or the support for somebody else, kill the caster first, you're like, great, I'm going to get several rounds of unmitigated damage with my main show, and then the side show is going to distract you. So the first good one is the NBC Mage, which is a CR6. They show up kind of late. They are demon demons. They are not native to the material plane, and if killed, they are banished. So they can come back with a vengeance later on. Great villains, not always great combat encounters. The sixth one, your tactics were brawl. I think brawl was the right way to go. The way to fight this monster is to make it pick the direction that it has to look and grappling it, forcing it to not be able to move. Because I think the tech that it has is to look one way, do its actions, and then move in such a way that it doesn't suffer the repercussions of those actions. And if you can take that movement away from it, I think that's the way to turn this guy off. Because he can turn and look in whatever direction he wants. If you prevent him from being able to move afterward, it stops him from like blasting the wizard and then looking at the wizard to turn the wizard off. Brawling, getting in close it can only turn off a couple of people at a time the only difficult part of that is tanking the entire approach which you guys did decently well i think i handed you a lot of wins when i was just like cool everybody's turned off oh and now i don't do anything yeah that's how these fights have always gone with the ivs that i've been in is once you get on it it's pretty much a done deal because you can just do the slap in the circle type thing with it if you guys still have your dice out blind oracle longfish and fear no equal please go and roll initiative for me a 20 11. Blind Oracle, you got higher initiative. Do you want to yell at Asia Wolf about what he should have been casting instead of Shatter? I don't have any brain power. Someone else needs to do this. Fear, you want a second shot? I'm pretty sure Fireball is just straight up as good at level 3 as Shatter at level 5. And I don't even know the rest of his spell list off the top of my head, but Fireball was going to drop like 43 or 53 off of just a maximized third level Fireball. Wrong answer. Longfish, you want to take us home? Chromatic Orc? Uh, I don't think it's chromatic orb. The right answer is magic missile. Maximized magic missile. There's no chance of saving against it. Fifth level magic missile is going to drop seven missiles. 
10 damage each, that's 70 damage. I was doing the math and I screwed up. I think Shatter's the answer and I completely spaced on Fireball, but yes, no, Magic Missile I think is the answer on this one because it doesn't get a, an attack roll. Absolutely no chance of saving. Also, the damage potential is just strictly higher with your plus five damage Magic Missiles. So, Any thoughts about the maps in particular? Things you like, things you didn't like? That's a brutal I-Beast layer. I-Beast shapes its own layer, so it would make it brutal. If it's really shaping its own layer, make the whole layer area water and you're even nasty steer that's a real tough environment yeah any thoughts about the others fine you know good tight corridors representative of an ib slayer was fine i think the gimmick of the chasm was interesting putting the chasm right there at the start where you have to get through it visually appealing especially against enemies that have darkness where like you can really prevent the adventurers from holing up in there and and using it to their advantage you can force them to have to come out <laughs> unless they use globe of vulnerability i was like yeah i was gonna just drop glo- oh i can't and even if i dropped darkness right in front of you guys that turns me off as much as it turns you off if i had to do it again i would probably move up towards the edge of the chasm just to get us a little bit more room with the globe a more effective complete 100 percent turn off got it encounters you liked what was the most fun blind oracle on a personal note this one just because rail gunning the tiger demon was hilarious you pincushion the pussycat 138 damage is going to be set down as the record for the next person to try to beat we broke it twice in this encounter <laughs> I am not a fan of weapon wielded by a good creature being a metric, being a mechanical impact. You could have a a very lawful person who's very opposed to the tiger demon. They have no inherent advantage. I think that that's a poor role-playing element. A good aligned character, as opposed to a neutral aligned character, should be able to do more damage. Tiger demon's lawful evil, so a lawful creature opposed to it wouldn't be as opposed as you think. My point being that a chaotic neutral is disadvantaged here in a way that is unfair and antithetical to a good role-playing approach. It's a, such a rare element of the game that it's just, they really should have not done that. Then just take the regular damage and don't get the vulnerability. Sure, but like, what if our rogue had been defined as chaotic neutral by the starter set? Oh, is it? I don't know. I, it might have been. What if it was? We just assumed it was good. I assumed everybody here was good because I said you are. I think it's fine. Most of my role-playing games, most don't play a good character because it's kind of hard to... The ones that do don't really role-play it effectively. <laughs> <laughs> what if we just have an entire party of evil characters? <laughs> that one's always fun. Well, then you're going to have to chew through the damage the old-fashioned way. Age of Wolf, encounter you thought was the most fun? It would probably be one or number one or this one. I thought these were kind of cool. I personally didn't enjoy 5, but that was kind of for obvious reasons. Yeah, you kind of got shut down. Not only did I not enjoy this because I got shut down, we really didn't get to show off the tiger demon and the things that it can do because (laughs) it got gunned down in a hallway by the rogue. It wound up actually being a slightly lackluster engagement because he just got murked so hard so fast. But the first four I thought were really good. Longfish? It was a grind, but like we grind through it. (laughs) That's a good question. Do you guys still think it's a grind at this level? It's more of a grind than it's been before? It can be. I felt like these encounters were grindy, but not like nothing overwhelming. It's just because of the tactics with this. I usually think of these as the meat and potatoes. I felt that the Beholder was more of a grind. We spent more time not being able to act not being able to move. The whole slog of getting into combat versus the the rest of these fights where things are more fluid, where things change from turn to turn, and there's more tactical questions available to you. I find that those are less grindy because you're always deciding something on your turn. It's not just, well, I move and I dash through difficult terrain to try and get to this enemy that's distant. When I think of a grind, I think of a situation where you have a fighter runs up to the enemy, hits it three times, and the enemy's like, okay, now I'm going to hit you back three times. Okay, rope's going to shoot me. Maybe somebody else shoots the rogue. Once the melee characters get up to the enemy, if you have more than two turns of them just hitting each other, it's like, okay, well, what really is going on here? What are we doing? Especially if they're missing. I feel at the level that you guys are at, like you just you clean up each time. The fighter doesn't spend about more than two rounds in contact with something before it's dead. That's kind of what I mean about the grind. Like you don't grind that much against. For this one, the advancement I don't see as a grind. It's only once you get in contact with them, then it's the grind starts. But even here, 180 hit points against four of you guys, that's, that's going to drop pretty quick. Rogue's doing about 40 a turn 
Fighter's doing about 30 a turn. Wizard's doing about 50 a turn when he can hit. Cleric's on the low end of the DPS. He does connect, he does damage, and especially AoE damage in certain scenarios. But single target damage, I think his is the lowest. It's probably around 15 on average. If you guys are just wailing on one target, then it's kind of like, all right, we're only going to be here for two rounds at most. Any tactics that did not get implemented that we wanted to see? Grappled another flying creature, so I'm good. And I got a blind off. I was pretty pleased with the blind the one time that it worked. Surprised you didn't blind the eye beast. I was honestly, I wasn't sure that it would work. The air elemental behind him was a more reliable damage output. Yeah, I was totally expecting you to put it right in front of his eye and blind him. <laughs> well, unless he had a specific interaction with blinded and I didn't know if he did, I figured the air elemental was the actual reliable one, but I could have gone for, for maximum meme value by using the gem of brilliance in front of his eyes. He has to be able to see his targets to do any of his attacks, so it kind of does have a specific thing against blinded. He also gets a save against that. He doesn't get a save against the air elemental. The next dungeon is a vampire crypt at 15th level. You guys are returned to see undead again, which we haven't seen for a while. Eighth level spells. All right, bring daylight. <laughs> That's all for the encounters descending into the I Beast Lair. Next week, we'll continue with level 15 and assaulting a vampire's castle. Thank you for stopping by. I'm Saracen Zero, and I hope to see you then.